Hello, and welcome to another Geotech Hour. This is a very special episode where we're celebrating the one-year anniversary for the Geotech Center at the Atlantic Council. I'm your host, Dr. David Bray, and this is a conversation where we're going to be focusing on the geotech decade ahead, specifically the decade in which we expect that data and technology will have disproportionate impacts on societies, on the world, on geopolitics, and how we live. We have a very august set of panelists here today. We're going to jump right straight to the conversation about where is the big picture in terms of where data and technology is taking the world in the decade ahead. I'd like to go first to Geotech Commissioner, as well as President at RPI, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson. Shirley, could you share with us your views about what are the big picture in terms of data and tech issues we need to address in the decade ahead? Thank you, David. The, the geotech decade is, is essentially a manifestation of or linked to what has been called the fourth industrial revolution by the World Economic Forum and others. Now, this essentially refers to how the digital, the biological, and the physical worlds are coming together. This confluence has created exciting new opportunities and worrisome vulnerabilities in social fabrics, in physical security, and geopolitics. Now, technology always exists on a knife edge in that it can be used for good or for ill. On the good side, digital technology has created new businesses and new ways of doing business. In the process, it is freeing people from being tied to just one place to do work and freeing people from more repetitive tasks in their work. Further, confluence in the cyber physical realm is creating new opportunities to monitor and control systems, structures, and components of key infrastructure and the built environment more generally. This allows us to create more energy efficiencies, healthier living and workspaces, and safer and more responsive and resilient infrastructure. The genomics revolution has brought breakthroughs in disease diagnosis and treatment. Indeed, the marriage of genomics with digital and nanotechnologies has led to both new diagnostic tests, such as the PCR tests, and new vaccines in the fight against COVID-19. At the same time, in a highly interconnected world, we all are subject to intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences when there is a triggering event. The emergence of SARS CoV-2, as it's called, is certainly an example. By forcing the rapid migration of all kinds of human interactions to digital platforms, the pandemic has underscored another source of vulnerability, the degree to which the cyber realm is merging with all other realms. Digital technologies are transforming our geopolitics, our national security, biomedicine, energy, agriculture, every aspect of our civilization. And so we have to prepare ourselves for the vulnerabilities that are being exposed. Uh, we even are entering a new area, era of cyber conflict in which the attack surfaces are vast. Over the past year, the U US has experienced two massive hacks. One suspected by many to be Russian in origin that compromised thousands of public and private sector entities, including reportedly seven federal departments and the national institutes of health and another suspected to be chinese in origin that breached email systems that possibly are used by key military contractors on a geopolitical scale the belt and road initiative that china is using uh, in its quest to be a cyber superpower uh, to project its economic its cultural and military power across the globe is shifting from concrete and steel infrastructure projects to digital technologies. And as Chinese companies move into poorer nations to lay fiber optic cables and establish communication networks, e-commerce, fintech, cloud computing, and big data projects, there is much to be concerned about, including that technologies from Chinese companies could allow China to spy on its client nations. That's what some have articulated that it may be exporting its own use of technology um, and people may then use it to exert social control. The question of who controls cyber standards comes into play that could disadvantage our own innovation ecosystem. And of course, uh, access to volumes of data that may allow uh, China, and it's just one example, to lead, leap ahead of the United States in artificial intelligence. 
Interestingly enough, though, technological diffusion and communications connectivity can lead to social control slipping away from the primacy of the state in several directions at once, both transnational alliances and alliances among internal groups that can use digital networks and platforms to challenge governments to disseminate their own narratives and even create instability. So with the advent of Internet of Things technology, including digital control systems and facilities management, cybersecurity now impacts physical security. For example, in February, as you know, hackers changed the level of lie in the drinking water of a small city in Florida. Had it not been caught in time, this could have sickened people severely. And as the life sciences merge further with engineering and computation, cyber biotechnology represents a particular kind of cyber physical threat. Hackers could conceivably manipulate biological data or the physical processing of biological materials and thereby use biological agents to cause harm. But again, there's a knife edge for good and for evil. Very well said, uh, Dr. Jackson. Really appreciated you saying how it is on a knife edge and, and it really is thinking about for good, for evil. You've also, I've heard you use the phrase, what's possible and what's perilous. And so be interested real quick before we go to some of our other panelists, how do you think that, that, that we as a society as a whole, um, not just those that spend a lot of time diving these issues, but we as a society as a whole should, should come together and start thinking about these issues? What's the best way we can mobilize some action on these, these challenges? Well, I'm going to give you a sales uh, argument. Mm -hmm. The kind of work that the Geotech Commission is doing is important in, in uh, having and, and helping policymakers to think more deeply about these issues and about the intersecting vulnerabilities, but then to not be afraid of the opportunity space. And I think that partnerships with the private sector and with universities are important, and each sector has a role to play and how we link up with NGOs and the like. And so that's a broader uh, question, but to have uh, the Atlantic Council, to have the Geotech Commission uh, help to lead the way in uh, structuring and encouraging uh, people who are the decision makers to come together across sectors and, and to learn more, but also then to educate the public. I think these are the important things to do. Really like that image, especially that it's, it's interconnected and working across uh, sectors. As we like to say, we're stronger together with allies, and that can be allies across countries, allies across different sectors, working together in interconnected fashion. So I, I thank you for that deeply, uh, Dr. Jackson. And would now like to also jump to another uh, geotech commissioner and, and longtime friend, uh, Vint Cerf, who has really seen one of the driving forces, the internet from, from where you played a pivotal role in help making it happen to where we are happen. Be interested in your thoughts, Vint, as well. What do you see as the big picture, um, both opportunities and challenges we have with data and tech on the next decade ahead? Thanks very much for the question, David. Uh, I have to say that uh, Dr. Jackson just covered the waterfront in a stunningly effective way. So I don't know whether I could do more than to put a little bit of mortar in between a few cracks here and there. Uh, let me start out by uh, confirming that uh, the notion of computational X is with us for the remainder of this decade and the rest of the century. We are learning how to apply computer capability, including some of the more recent uh, things like machine learning and neural networks, and the, some of the speculative uh, things like uh, quantum computing, if it ever emerges to a point where it's applicable to uh, real world problems. All of those are influencing the way in which we conduct research and engineering and the like. So I think we should all be listening for computational X in many contexts that we wouldn't normally think of, computational linguistics, computational chemistry, physics, biology, astrophysics, and so on. Uh, the second thing that I would observe is that uh, Dr. Jackson's uh, point about dependencies uh, is extremely well taken. And I think we should, as a commission and, uh, and as the, you know, frankly, uh, the rest of the world, start thinking in system terms about how things depend on each other to function successfully. Uh, cascade failures, I'm afraid, are a real risk, an increasing risk. Heavy dependence on electricity, on electronics, uh, and on complex software environments. 
uh, spell uh, considerable uh, fragility, potential risk of fragility. And I think we need to learn to think our way through that and do our designs uh, in a more careful fashion. By the way, it's not just technical. Uh, the other issue here has to do with sustainability, which is a popular UN topic, as you know. Uh, but here I'm thinking about business models that will allow these complex structures not only to be robust and resilient, but to be sustainable. Uh, again, not necessarily a technical matter, but surely one uh, which is important to all of us. Um, I would say that uh, many of our vulnerabilities uh, are a consequence of, um, shall I say, crappy software. Uh, some of this is almost deliberate. If you think about the uh, open source movement, which has had tremendous benefit because people get to learn from other people and enhance what they've learned uh, from those open source libraries. But the problem is that uh, everybody assumes everybody else has found all the bugs because after all, they're all exposed, right? So nobody really pays attention to that. And we end up with a lot of bad software showing up in devices like the ones that Dr. Jackson mentioned, the Internet of Things, security devices, uh, convenience devices, our household appliances, business uh, and industry systems and the like. And that software may in fact be quite vulnerable and we're getting plenty of uh, examples of that. Uh, and uh, while she's absolutely correct to point out the specific nation state attacks that have occurred from China, Russia, and possibly elsewhere, um, we also have the problem that these mistakes are also discovered by just curious people. And in many cases, they are exploited. Uh, so even the, the weaknesses have allowed non-nation state attacks against the systems, and that's very scary. Uh, uh, just two other things. Uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned uh, misinformation and disinformation and its rapid propagation in the internet. Um, and the, the vehicles by which this happens tend to be social media. And I think we need a much deeper understanding of how people think uh, and why they think the way they think in order to uh, defend against the abusive uh, use of these social media. Uh, the companies that make these uh, applications uh, have tried to make them attractive uh, to keep people on board, but also to show advertising and generate revenue, all of which is perfectly okay, except for the fact that some of the mechanisms lead to more and more extreme behavior because it gets attention and attention captures people's uh, interest. So we have some serious work to do from the sociologists and the psychologists and maybe even the uh, people who understand the neural structure of the brain uh, to learn how to defend against those things. Last point, just because I can't resist, is that there's lots to look ahead uh, off planet. Uh, and I would say during this next decade, we will see a significant uh, uh, return to space, first with the Artemis missions to the moon, uh, perhaps additional missions to the uh, asteroids, and of course, the leading up to, uh, a, uh, I hope, a uh, man landing on the moon, possibly not in this decade, but in the next to follow. And that's very exciting to be uh, involved in and to watch uh, um, uh, take place. And so I think this is going to be a really interesting decade for all of us. Really appreciate that, that capturing the wave um, crest that we can expect to see then. And, and I know, and I, and I really appreciate the different thoughts that you had about being ready for a computational X in terms of new ways of, of approaching how we apply computational sciences to different fields. I also appreciate your remarks about needing to understand how humans uh, and how we think and, and actually understand information to actually address misinformation, disinformation, because I know you and I and, and a lot of others with the People Center and that have done a lot there as well. I guess uh, I'd be interested because we know a lot of policymakers aren't necessarily engineers and vice versa. So how do we help bring systems level thinking and engineering thinking to a policy domain uh, that may need it for the decade ahead? Well, it, it certainly won't work to simply stand up and say, you should think in the following way or you're stupid and you should pay attention. Right. But what I do think though, is that there is, is first of all, geotech has a convening capacity, which is important. Uh, what I would propose is that we identify um, issues and problems that everybody will care about, regardless of you know, their disciplines, uh, and have discussions about the problems and solutions to them, as opposed to uh, trying to force someone to think in a particular way. 
I, I believe, honestly, that if we apply the tools of systems analysis and systems thinking uh, in the course of those discussions to try to articulate how we would analyze the problems and what, uh, uh, what means we might use to resolve them, that uh, we can bring people along uh, to appreciate the power of that kind of thinking. I really like how you frame that. And then, like you said, you can't force anyone to think a certain way, but if you bring people along, I think I'm reminded of that proverb that says, if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's really what trend is scoring there is we need to go through together. So I thank you for that, Vint. And now I'd like to go to another geotech commissioner uh, and also um, notable uh, chairman, Mike, Michael Rogers. Thank you for joining us as well. And I'd ask you, recognizing again, it's a hard act to follow both uh, Shirley and Vint, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about the decade ahead and the specific lens in terms of all that you've seen and what you're seeing on the horizon. What are the challenges that you expect that we'll have with data and tech in the decade ahead? Yeah, thanks, David. And you're, you're doing a phenomenal, you and your team are doing a phenomenal job setting this uh, commission up, I think, for success and impact, which I think is the most important thing we can do. Very hard to follow Vince and Dr. Jackson. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you could have stopped right after Dr. Jackson. We probably would have been well. Then you added Vint just to insult Melissa and I, I think. <laughs> uh, we do. I do appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. I, I thought I'd take a different tack because I think they laid out the case pretty well that we're in a very precarious place. We are well connected, but we are not very well secured. Uh, and I worry uh, that, and, and I did a piece on this not that long ago that was pretty poignant on this. Uh, and Solar Winds is a great example to me. Had that been a destructive attack, we would have been in real trouble, very real trouble. Uh, and I think that goes, um, well, people just aren't paying attention to the possibility of what that impact could have been. And if you look across what you saw happening in Texas because of a weather problem, imagine. Uh, this magnified as a cyber problem. And I think uh, Vint talks to, uh, very well about it when he talked about the cascading effects. You start turning things off and making smart things dumb, like paperweights, uh, we have a huge problem because of our re extra reliance on internetworking communications, uh, even on our IT networks. So all of that spells trouble for me. Uh, and I look at the next decade as we're either going to really get this right or we are going to be in a ton of trouble. And if you look at some of the things that bother me today, I would talk about, you know, the corporate surveillance state. Uh, and if you look about if that transfers to government, what that means. And the good news is we don't have to be Orwellian and think 10 years down the road. Uh, the China social credit system is exactly a surveillance state where they score every individual citizen based on their social media, their contact with the government. Uh, and other things, including their free free uh, opinions or not so free opinions in China. Uh, and they come up with a score and then they take things away from you if you don't score high enough, according to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, within the last couple of years, they've denied millions of Chinese citizens the ability to buy a train ticket or a plane ticket, even to travel inside of China to visit family and other things because the Chinese Communist Party decided they weren't good enough citizens. And if you start thinking that's, by the way, again, this is happening now. This isn't something that's happening in the future. Uh, and if you look at America, we're a little bit different. We don't have that problem. We have a corporate surveillance system that's uh, large and extensive and not well understood. And I think policymakers are just now trying to wrestle with what that means. And again, that's all about that interconnectivity, speed to market. All of those things can be really positive, good things, but it also has some perils associated with it. And I just don't think we have, uh, as policymakers at large, have thought through this problem as we move forward uh, and what that means. And then of course, the bad actors who get in and use these systems today, deep fakes could, are gonna ruin corporate careers, they're gonna ruin political careers uh, because of the, the, uh, the nature of which they can do high-end deep fakes and get them into the social media stream so quickly, really hard to turn that around. That has massive disruptive capability in our, in our self-governance. Uh, and you have seen a little bit of this with uh, nation states dabbling in 2016, great example, the Russians still at it, the Chinese now doing, trying similar things in the Pacific Rim, trying to use those kind of tactics and techniques to influence countries there. And so liberal democracies are gonna have to, I think, band together on this uh, and come up with some standards, or we are going to be in real trouble in the future because that that a capability is now steeping out, if you will. So it's not just nation states; it's proxy 
organizations that these governments are allowing to have it. And once it hits those proxies, it'll get to a broader set of bad people having the capability to do really uh, high end deep fake change the world kind of events that we we just again we just don't understand it and their ability to stay anonymous out there is also changing there's a recent study they were able to identify in an anonymous study uh, i think this was out of denmark 99.9 percent .9 of the participants even when the data wasn't filled out correctly and they got it accurate which wow. tells you that even in a, a, in a in a scholastic environment or a medical environment where you're trying to have these anonymous tests uh, there's a problem, right? So if uh, commercial entities, you can imagine what trouble they might cause by trying to get after people who are participating in these studies uh, or people who want to influence the outcome of these studies. I mean, so we have these kind of new security uh, paradigms that we're I don't think we're ready to do. That said, and I just want to quickly go through, I made a quick list of things that I think are great and stuff <laughs> we have to worry about. Big data analytics uh, certainly is going to be, a, a, I think, the key, the key effort in the next decade. Uh, it's going to be augmented analytics with AI and machine learning because of those uh, big data, big data lake sets that have real value and positive uh, impact in, a, in the country, but done incorrectly can cause immeasurable harm. Quantum is coming. I think you're going to see a hybrid. Be interested in Vince on that. I think we're seeing hybrid uses now where they're using some capability in uh, calculations with supercomputers married up that I think we'll see some benefit from that going in uh, to this next de decade. Nanotechnology, I'm all about it. Uh, growing carbon tubes uh, to help uh, on thermo, uh, re reducing heat in transistors, I think is gonna be really significant if you realize how much we're going into a, a reliant on transistors and other things. Um, digital twins, it's going to change the way we look at just about everything. It's changing the intelligence community as we speak. Uh, and it's also changing the way I think companies, businesses are looking at developing products in a way that's cheaper uh, with a higher benefit on the other side. Uh, and I don't, I'll, I'll, I don't want to go on too long, but uh, uh, on genomics, gene editing, I think with, uh, the, with combination of quantum and supercomputer and understanding those is going to be life changing for all of us in a good way. Uh, it also has the perils of ethics that we're going to have to look at in the next 10 years, which we're not really paying attention to. Do you want somebody to be able to change a baby in the womb on what their certain uh, characteristics might be? Boy, that starts sounding pretty Orwellian to me pretty quickly. And we better just understand it. And I don't think we do. And we haven't had that great public debate on it. Uh, 5G and, the, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, Jackson talked very well about this. The way we're expanding the threat surface with every sensor. If you talk to the military today, they'll tell you uh, that the way they're gonna win fights in the future on the battlefield is by who gets the most data from all of the sensors on the battlefield, including soldiers and weapons and mortar tubes, gets that process through an IL, IA algorithm and gets that information back to leaders in a combat environment. Who does that faster and quicker? will win the next fight. And so all that battle now is about how you uh, aggregate uh, and understand that data uh, and, that, and analyze that data in the quickest time and the quickest way to get that back to the policymakers. I think it's all fascinating, it's exciting, it's interesting, but again, we just need to understand and bring policymakers with the challenges that come with the perils that these things produce. Very well said, uh, Chairman Rogers. Really appreciate you, you highlighting, um, and, and that was, uh, you, you definitely raised the bar even higher for Melissa, so Melissa's gonna have a little bit <laughs> of challenge, but before I go to Melissa, Chairman Rogers, I, I think it was Ben Franklin, when the Constitution was signed, said he could rest easy knowing the great American experiment would continue for another 50 years. Well, we're now 240 years since then, so I'd be interested, you know, Vint had talked about how you need to do a big tent and bring people along. You talked about bringing along policymakers. What might be ways that you think that, that, that different types of organizations, be they private sector NGOs, can help bring along policymakers in identifying the experiments that we need to do to keep the great American experiment and, and our ideals globally continuing in the world ahead? So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Thanks, Dave. Huge, huge challenge. And I think Ben Franklin also said, uh, when asked what, what uh, came out of the convention, he said, you have a republic if you can keep it. Yeah. Uh, and so it is, we, we, and we're still working to try to keep that republic. Uh, listen, I think there is a disconnect in the way that policymakers think of these problems. Uh, and we, I think groups like the commission, other uh, academia is going to have to help 
bring people along about educating on the problems. Um, you know, I think America is woefully and probably blissfully ignorant on what the threats are currently uh, in, in cyberspace. I think they know there's a problem. I think that they know they have passwords. They have to do multi-authentication on their bank accounts, even though it irritates them. But if you had to describe, you know, what could happen here if, if this thing really gets upside down, don't think they could tell you. Well, policymakers are a reflection of that as well. If I come to Congress and I'm an ag person and I love ag issues and I'm on the ag committee, that's what I know. And that's what I do. And that's great other than we're going to have to bring all of the policymakers, including throughout the U.S. government as well, understanding the perils that come with it. I think it's just an education process uh, at the very best. And what you don't want to have happen is some event that promotes uh, rapid learning, if you know what I mean. Right. Uh, exactly. You would like to have this, so we would get ahead of this topic before some big event that causes some catastrophic event happens. And you know this is that time-honored thing. I do believe that we ought to have a liberal democracy organization, a little bit like NATO, on technology as we move forward. We ought to bring every liberal democracy in the world together and say, "Listen, there are we have some problems facing us from countries who don't don't want our democracies to survive, at least in the way they are today. Uh, we ought to come together on some common standards." Uh, in a common way forward on this technology and understanding the risks involved. Right now we're so bifurcated, really hard to get there. And I guarantee you sitting down with the, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, government and the Russian government and the Iranian government is not gonna help you because they know this is an advantage for them. They're not gonna give away their advantage very lightly. I think we should come together, again, as I said, these liberal democracies to try to move this thing forward. And that just takes effort and conversation and, and keeping at this thing. Really like that, that's a, that's a great vision and thank you for sharing that, Chairman Rogers. And so Melissa, Dr. Melissa Flagg, you are now been handed the baton and this relay lays for the final lap. Um, She's batting cleanup, that's what it is. Exactly. All, the, all the, we screwed up ahead of her. <laughs> so with that, Melissa, your chance to share what has not been said as to what do you think are the opportunities and challenges for the decade ahead? Over to you, you Melissa. You hand the non-resident fellow the cleanup <laughs> job after three commissioners. I mean, I think I do actually serve at the pleasure, so let's <laughs> hope I don't <laughs> screw it up too bad. You should be um, great. I, I will, as usual, David, as you expect of me, take a slightly different perspective on this. I, I mean, I think so much amazing stuff has already been said about technology and about the confluence of technology and about cascading threats. Um, but I want to take this and, and pull on Chairman Rogers' discussion of education and perhaps think about this from a more human-centric perspective, which you know is sort of my jam. Um, I think that one of the big challenges that we have right now is that education requires trust. And one of the things that we really have seen over the last few decades is a growing distrust of institutions, not just in this country, but around the world. A frustration with capitalism, an increasing amount of inequality. And that has really challenged, I think, the everyday person to trust institutions to take care of them. Now, fast forward to 2021, we see supply chains disrupted by COVID. We see the power grid go down in Texas. We see this morning, David, you're telling us about the cloud going down in France, right? And these types of things not working, they really do sort of um, lift up this challenge that people have with institutional trust. Now combine this with so much connectivity where we've also started to break down the dependence on local community. We haven't really um, focused on that as policymakers. We haven't embraced that localities and states, they play a really critical role in tr trust in institutions because your sort of trust or distrust of the government or uh, these sort of overarching organizations, it starts with, do I trust the government to pick up my trash? Do I trust the local school board to make good decisions for my kids? Right? It trust, it st trust starts with the government that you see every day. And it goes up right to the state level where I see my representative at the grocery store sometimes, right? And then to the federal level where I never see those people ever. And if you want people to trust that level, 
you have to start by empowering people. So I want to take the geotech on, I want to take the geotech center on the road. Uh I want to have a geotech hour in every state in the country. And I want to have people from that state who represent different perspectives talking about the challenges and the problems and the frustrations they have. Like what does technology mean to them? I think if you start with listening, education is easier. Uh, It's really hard to educate people if they neither trust you nor it turns out you don't really understand the problem they're most focused on. Um, And so I I want us to really think first about the fact that I do think before you get to education, you do have to take trust seriously. Um, And that we do have a nation that is very diverse and it is very, very heterogeneous and we need to respect that even if we don't like that. And that does mean going to meet people where they are and helping them build some resiliency and trust in their communities that we can then hopefully sort of roll up to a a larger uh, handling of these issues at at the national level. I think the other thing I would say is, I think we are coming to the end of an era and we have not emotionally accepted this. And that is, we are coming to the death of false efficiency. Toyota and Walmart, you know, they started this incredible revolution where their bottom lines, they were they were helped by all this just in time logistics and just living on the knife edge, right? A, a different knife's edge of a sort of profit loss, right? Of really only having what you need, where you need it, when you need it. I think that we are beginning to see that that is not actually efficient if well-being and the mission is not just that company's bottom line in that quarter, but is actually their ability to service a population over time. And I think we have to really reframe resiliency as a national imperative. And that has to really make us think about um, reframing what efficiency looks like, not just in corporate America, but at the national level as well. And that so what if it costs a little bit more to have a backup plan? Um, I, I think we've proven this, if we've proven nothing else in the last year, we've proven that resiliency has a place and it has a value. I also just one last thing want to say, I think sometimes it's easier to quantify the risk I can count Chinese universities that have a relationship with the government or something like this. It's very hard to count the opportunities lost because of fear. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage people to remember that this is a cost benefit analysis for our nation. What we are securing is a way of life. It's not, it's not a military. We're not, we're not trying to be as secure as we can be for the sake of being secure. We are trying to secure a way of life. And that means well-being of our citizens. And in order to do that, we do have to make sure that people understand the threat. And I have spent most of my life in the Department of Defense, so I respect it and I know it and I understand it. But I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that that has to go into a cost-benefit analysis where you see the cost, but now what is this benefit of, of taking this action anyway? of just saying, I'm going to accept this risk because it's worth it. Um, And I think this is what we need to make sure we bring to the conversation around threat. Yes, we need to educate people on threat, but we also need to make sure that we don't forget about the opportunity cost of fear. And I I think that's the next decade. I think we're going to struggle with these and in good ways. Well, and, and if I could build on what you were saying, because I really liked one, uh, I, I, I had the mental image of the geotech RV going from state to state. Um, maybe we can do that once we get out of COVID-19. But, but, but you also talked about the importance of creating safe spaces where you start with listening first and education second, which I think is so key. I mean, you have to listen to, be under, you know, to, to understand where, where people are coming from. And then two, you talked about creating safe spaces where it's not just about the threat and the fear holding you down, it's thinking about, you know, in some cases, the biggest risk is actually doing nothing at all and and assuming status quo. And if we keep on doing status quo, we may just plow right into that mountain that's right in front of us. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about what are things we can do as we get out of COVID-19? There still is a challenge of right now, not everyone's been vaccinated, we can't all get together. How do you think we should go about having conversations locally, scaling it nationally, and then maybe ideally globally on those safe spaces for those that do want to work towards open societies and embrace freedom and individual choice? 
Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things I would say that are just maybe they seem quite tactical for this group, but you know me, I love a solution. Um, I think the first thing I would do is engage the land grant universities, right? I'd go to APLU and say, let's have a real conversation about because that really anchors, they're an anchor in every state, right? That really allows um, a bridge to a state to say, what are the kinds of problems folks are struggling with? What are the types of sort of um technology challenges that exist in your state i'll use missouri as an example we have an inordinate number of nuclear reactors here right we are all about nuclear in missouri um research reactors we have one of the few high enrichment high enriched uranium reactors left in the country um and so we have a different set of issues when it comes to like catastrophic events right than say montana has or say massachusetts although massachusetts also has one of those reactors so maybe I should, that's a bad example <laughs> maine um and so i do think that building some relationship with organizations like that as an example is a really interesting way to have a physical anchor in every state that can help you reach people and have conversations that center around their own challenges another thing that i would suggest is that the federal government think about instead of we sit and decide what the problem is and everybody writes proposals to try to get money from us to solve the problem we believe is is the most important thing maybe what we start to do is actually have states and regions put forward a set of problems that they've gathered through engagement strategies in their area and say we will put in matching funds to the government if you help us solve this problem using technology this is a great way for people to begin to engage with technology in a safe way and to start to have a security dialogue with them around technology in a meaningful space and i i do think that um the government plays such an incredible role the federal government in the convening power that they have and in the position they have of having a loud voice um but they need to reposition themselves into being a team member rather than a chairman of the board, in my opinion, if we really want to bring people back into a trusted conversation. Very helpful. I really appreciate that, Melissa, and I do agree. It, it is about making it so it is a team environment. I think that's something that we strive to do here at the Geotech Center with the commission, and I really appreciate all that you do as our senior fellow, and, and I think that was a really good job of doing much more than batting cleanup. You really provided some additional uh, dimensions to our questions and thoughts here today. I'm going to segue now with our um, with our panelists to uh, the questions that we're getting through the Zoom. As always, if people have additional questions, um, put them in and we'll try to get them as quickly as possible. I'm going to go first, actually, to uh, Chairman Rogers. We have a question from a, a David who asks, he says, um, are there things that can be done to harden individuals against undue influence beyond just critical thinking? If we assume the environment is a battle space that is, is what do people think cognitive that, that societies like the United States can be divided um, in terms of what we think and what we agree on in ways that say China can't because they, they filter what people see. What, what would be your recommendations, Chairman Rogers, to help people uh, harden themselves against undue influence? Oh, boy, I, uh, you, you got me started. I could take an hour on this. I mean, I'd start with a simple fact of our education system is kind of abandoning what it means to live in a liberal democracy. There was a study a couple of years ago, it was University of Pennsylvania, I believe, that only one in four adults can name all three branches of government. Think of that number. One in four adults can name all three branches of government. I was just flabbergasted by this. Uh, and the numbers aren't getting any better as they go back. So these folks are getting out into the world and talk about uh, the ability to influence somebody. If you don't understand the way the system works um, and somebody convinces you to do something bad, I don't know, say storm the Capitol, and you don't understand how your government works, guess what? You're more susceptible to that. Same with the threats that are coming at us from countries that don't have our best interests at heart. And so I think if we don't get a handle on uh, a teaching what it is to be an American and why we're lucky to be here, number one, uh, and what that means we can do for, you know, uh, individual possibilities, we've got to get that part right. Uh, and then we, I think it's still an educational process. There's no way that uh, there's people who graduate that don't understand that that security is a part of whatever they do, even in social media. They don't quite grasp that part of it and that everything that they're putting out there is there forever. So I remember that when I was going to school, 
Uh, I, I may be the oldest one uh, uh, on this uh, on the panel. Uh, vent. I may be the old. I may be the oldest one. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that from you. Uh, but I don't know if you remember this. But when you got in trouble in school, and I know Vent was in trouble in school, uh, they would tell you if you're not careful, we'll put make this part of your permanent record. Right. And that was terrifying for us. We thought, oh my God, we can't have this part of our permanent record. I better shape up. Think of it. Everything they're doing now is it's there. It's there forever. It is not going away. So I, this, I think there is a huge misconception about what social media means and how you interact with yourself, your community writ large. Uh, and I, I really worry about this. I'm, maybe this is probably way too long for this question. But if we don't start educating ourselves appropriately to, to withstand, to have that critical thinking when I'm ready to engage in in voting or whatever else I do in the world, including mass use of social media, man, we're going to be in trouble because those people are just, to me, so easy to manipulate. And so that's what the Russians know. That's why they're doing it. That's what the Chinese are doing. I mean, they're all, they've all got onto this uh, and we are our own worst enemies. And so I wish there was something bigger than critical thinking. I will say this, that, uh, that I was the, the, the National Security Agency going into 2018 knew we were gonna have this uh, information operation campaign that was trying to get Americans at each other's throats, by the way. They wanted the Russians, we need to understand this, the Russians wanted us not to like each other. Mm -hmm. And I argue they probably did a pretty darn good job at doing this to us. And we fell for it, uh, where we just decided we don't like each other in America much anymore, uh, which is really, I think is really dangerous. Well, one of the things that, that the NSA was able to do, the National Security Agency was able to do in 2018, they couldn't do in 2016, they were a little ready for it, is play whack-a-mole with this. They could go out and find it uh, and try to turn it off. And yes, it would come back on, but they were successful at being very good at this whack-a-mole game in 2018. And I think they tried to do that into 2020. So we're going to have to have more of that, candidly, uh, as well as this underpinning of, hey, we got to have a level set on education uh, both on what it means to be secure in a digital age, because I think that's very, very different, uh, and what it means uh, to be part of a democracy where you have the ability to impact your government uh, versus what you hear being said in, throughout social media. And so I think it's a combination of all of those things uh, all at the same time, and we better hurry up. <laughs> very well said, and I think uh, I'm reminded of how you, you actually said as well, um, and Ben Franklin said, you have a republic if you can keep it. Uh, part of that is we all have to play a role in making sure we keep it. Absolutely. Uh, I'm now going to go to uh, actually Dr. Jackson. Um, so Dr. Jackson, we have a question from John who says, system syncing dependencies would be a huge step forward. Um, is there a role for applying complexity theories to these problems as well? Um, thinking about emergent behavior, should we consider that field of study as well? I know this is something you're passionate as well with uh, Dr. Jackson. So your thoughts about applying complexity theory, emergent behaviors to um, policies as well as what we do as societies. You know, I'm not a total expert in complexity theory, but I certainly uh, look at complex problems and, and how one goes about solving them. I do think that that has a role. Um, the, the real issue becomes uh, what data do you use, what variables uh, do you lay out, and, and how much of it is based on a, a model against which you test things versus just seeing what comes out. And, and I think there has to be some of each. Um, but I do think people uh, need to be able to address things that are a lot more complex than they are. And it goes back to things that uh, uh, Chairman Rogers talked about in terms of what do we do in our baseline education? Now, I heard something this morning that talked about the US being different than, say, Europe, at least the Europe of some time ago, where we are really a multicultural uh, society and one uh, varying religions and so on. And so we're less based on, on you know, one unitary culture, even though there are, you know, are varying opinions about that, and more based on creed. And the question is, how do we live out that creed and ensure that it, it really applies? I am with the Chairman Rogers about uh, people learning the rudiments of, of what our government is about, about you know, how that uh, plays into over, overall uh, a common real, common good perspective and so societal organization. I further think 
that it's important, and I go back to something Melissa talked about. Melissa, you said you had these reactors in your state. Well, as a former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I'm very sensitive to those issues. And that actually is what led me to uh, have people think about this issue of intersecting vulnerabilities with cascading consequences, because that is the root of, root of effective quote unquote regulation, but beyond the regulation, effective operation of complex facilities. And so, but there are opportunities, uh, David, to look at uh, emergent themes, emergent behaviors, uh, using things like uh, complexity theory and things that can tell you if in fact there is a pandemic that is uh, emerging. Uh, can tell you things that there's some other disease propagation um, and help you to understand if they are emerging bio threats. Uh, AI plays a strong role in that and can help us more. And so I think it's both the question of bringing people together across sectors, across geographies, across ethnicities. When I was chairman of the NRC, you know, there were these environmental groups and they were very, uh, you know, some of them anti-nuclear but they had their points of view. We had the Congress and I always respected what the Congress had to do. I mean, Congress people have a gazillion things on their plates. So we would bring them in. So I would create round tables where I would bring in uh, the CEOs of nuclear companies, the uh, congressional staff, if the, con if the Congress people couldn't come themselves, the heads of environmental organizations and the commissioners so that we would sit and listen to everyone and try to understand what was the river that ran through it. And therefore, how did that influence how we should operate as, as regulators? And so I'm a big believer in bringing people together across sectors. But because of what I do for a living, which is to educate the next generation of, of leaders in science and technology, but also the attendant public policies that have to go along with it, how we educate our young people and not just give them technical knowledge, but, but how they have experiential parts to their education as well as what we do in the classroom that make them understand what it means to be a citizen and, and, and to a citizen of this nation and a citizen of the world. So there's a constitution day and we take that seriously. And so we actually stop in the classroom to talk about the constitution and what it means. And we have all of our professors do it. And many of our professors have come from other countries, but, but all of them do it. And, and, and I think, and many of our students as well. So I think these things that bring us together across the common wheel, the common good, I think are important. And in the end, and let me just talk very quickly about one last thing. I agree again with the chairman uh, Rogers about the whole question of where liberal democracies have to play. But here's the thing. You have a China that's going around with its Belt and Road Initiative. It started with hard infrastructure, you know, on land and, and sea, let us say, and, and even air with, with different airports, ports, and so forth. It now is going to become, increasingly becoming a digital Silk Road. And that's on top of their use of uh, their vaccines. Uh, so you could call it a, a, adding a little bit of a biological thing. Now, we can imagine what they have in mind and know really, ultimately. But the question becomes, what is our proffer? What is our proffer in terms of understanding their needs and meeting them where they are? And then my last and final comment goes back to education. So I'm a, I'm a PhD physicist and we have PhD programs. But I tell you what, I have often said, and some of my friends may not agree with this, give me a child and let me have that young person till they're in the second or third grade. Mm -hmm. I don't have to put them on the internet. I just need to teach them how to read and write, think on their feet, and along the way add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Because then when I introduce them to the internet, it will take 10 minutes for them to become facile with what they're doing, at least at a rudimentary level. But they will have had the chance and be pushed to do more complex thinking and therefore hopefully begin to sort out, you know, what they read, what they see and not be drawn into things. 
But we also on the educational side have to begin to understand more what do digital technologies mean or do to young people in terms of cognition and learning. And that's something we are doing at the university. So Shirley Jackson for president. I was gonna say exactly. <laughs> yep. Put me in. <laughs> I think you have, we have solid support here, Dr. Jackson. <laughs> As a father of a three-year-old, I wholeheartedly agree with your, your, your remarks about education and, 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 and helping there. Um, so we have about nine minutes left. Normally I'd go to lightning round, but I think I'm going to try and squeeze in two short questions real quick to Vint and then to Melissa if I can do it. We'll see if we can do it. We may go a little bit over, but Vint, uh, we have some questions in here, and in, in, if you could keep it kind of short. Um, one was this idea um, that we had been talking about the chairman in reference, maybe a, a NATO or a Bread and Woods 2.0 and some, some sort of organization that brings together different uh, democracies around the world. Um, would be interested in your thoughts about, because obviously the internet in some respects, um, you know, we've seen that in terms of how the internet came together as well. What would you be your ways, and, and recognize again, very short period of time, one or two minutes, how would you, 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 would you, would you see envisioning bringing together countries that want to stand for openness, uh, open innovation, um, freedom of thought and freedom of choice to come together? Well, the short answer is that I would try to change the definition of win. We are too focused on winners and losers and zero sum thinking. And that even shows up in distinguishing between the uh, liberal uh, nations and those that are not. When we're faced with a common threat, uh, food security, climate change, uh, with, uh, vulnerabilities and cascade failures, learning how to cooperate and treating that as winning seems to me awfully important. And I see the internet as an example of that because it, it is a grand collaboration across the world to build pieces of the internet connecting together. So let's, let's redefine what win means and see if we can make a better meme. Very well said, and I thank you for that event. That was definitely on target. And so now, Melissa, you get the final question, which was obviously you 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 played a role in different roles in public service, including uh, overseeing a lot of interesting R and D budgets. Um, do you think there's a need for multi-year funding focusing on emerging technologies that that funds not just what government does, but ideally has grants to state and, and local areas to show impacts? And not to make that a loaded question, but, but but what's been your experience and how much are we hampered by the budget cycle that we currently have in the United States? And are there creative ways we can overcome that, not just within government, but maybe working with the private sector and other states as well? Well, if I can just give you an example, <laughs> ARPANET project from DARPA was funded from 1969 to 1990. The internet project and NSF was funded starting around 1982 and continues to this day. Hmm. So in spite of the fact that we don't have multi-year budgets, which I am in favor of trying to establish, the uh, government agencies that support research have found ways to be persistent in hmm. terms of uh, their research support. And so uh, the problem is real, but there have been ways to work around it. Excellent. Thank you, Vint. And now Melissa Flagg. Dr. Melissa Flagg, I have one last question for you. It comes from a um, combination of Andrew and Bob asking, so we did talk about behavioral and thinking about behavior and people. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about ethical frames. And so recognizing in one minute or two minutes, could you give us a thoughts about how do we bring in ethics as we also embrace innovation too? Uh, over to you, Melissa. Um, as usual, I think I would start with um, instead of deciding what the values are and the ethical framework is and then educating people without talking to them first, I would start by sitting down and saying, um, what are your concerns about technology, right? I think we need to make this a decade where technology serves the people and the people are not just serving and feeding technology. We have spent a decade using people to generate data in service of making more money on technology and telling them it's convenient and telling them that they're getting a lot from that. And I and I and we are. But I do think we need to alter that frame where we have this conversation around ethics and we need to really start it with the question of what are the things you really want most from technology? What are the things that you value the most? What are you willing to give up to have that? And then let's put some ethical frames around that understanding kind of what people actually want instead of what companies and the federal government and policy wants like me want. 
Um, and I think we don't start that conversation very often by actually meeting people where they are. And I, I just don't think we're going to get away with this for another decade. I, I think we need to do it proactively or it's going to be done for us. Very well said. We have to do data and tech with people and meet them where they are. All right, so now we're going to the lightning round in which I'm going to go to each of our folks and ask for two to three tweet links. So you each get about one minute. And actually, that means, Melissa, you're up first as to what are your two to three tweet links recommendations that we take away from this as how do we move forward for the geotech decade ahead? The next decade is the decade where we see the death of false efficiency. <laughs> um, resiliency has a value and people even if they don't think like you, even if they are not as educated as you, they ultimately decide whether you are in charge or not. And we need to take that seriously. Let's take the geotech hour on the road. I'm driving the van. All right, sounds good. As soon as, as, soon as we all get the vaccinations and we can go out, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm, I think we can put in that pitch. I'm not sure which government agency will make the grant application to, but we'll find a place to do the, the geotech road tour. I think that would be great. Maybe we can get, maybe we can get NPR to actually support. All right, so now I'd like to go to Chairman Rogers. Uh, your two to three tweet links recommendations that we should do as we think about the decade ahead. Yeah, I think the next decade ahead is really getting a handle on what is possible and what is perilous and understanding them both when it comes to sustainability. I'm excited about tech applied there. Resilience, we must be resilient in our reliance on technology. If we are not, we are doomed. Uh, and then I would look at the privacy and security aspects of this next decade, which could uh, be phenomenal, and it could also be a colossal train wreck. So I, I, it's th those that would be my takeaway, if I could. Very well said, Chairman. And I really want to thank you for all your service. Thank you for your continuing guidance as we move forward, both with the Atlantic Council and also in the world. And really appreciate your sharing those wise remarks with us. I'd now like to go to Vint. Uh, so Vint, your two to three takeaways for what we should do for the decade ahead. I'm sure I have two or three, but the first thing I would do is tell everybody to read uh, Aesop's fables, particularly the ants and the grasshoppers, and I think Melissa will uh, <laughs> resonate with that, uh, because it's actually it's a good point. And the second one has to do with uh, asking ourselves, why are we willing to rely on insecure and vulnerable systems? Convenience seems to be, immediate convenience and immediate gratification seem to be driving us we should be thinking longer term, how do we do that? Excellent, like you said, let's, let's, let's make sure we are the, uh, the, the one that, that puts things into the future, invests in the future, and like you said, have a long-term horizon as we look to it, because if we can be bold, brave, and benevolent for the future ahead, that will lead to better outcomes. I would now like to finally let uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Jackson, you have the last word to uh, bring it home for us. Thank you. Colin, how I began. I think we have to become more deliberate and careful in assessing the intersecting risks of emerging technologies and how those technologies intersect with how we live. But then I think we can use technology to create more resilient and responsive infrastructure to create healthier and more resilient work and living spaces to enhance our national and global security, to personalize medicine, to teach our young people in new ways, uh, marrying technology to individualize learning with more of a civic mindedness about the common wheel. And especially to be highly imaginative in using technology to create new links among people across borders, cultures, and generations. And with that, to bring opportunity to all of us. Very well said. Thank you for that, Dr. Jackson. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, you all have been quite inspiring as we look at the next 10 years ahead. Thank you for our audience for joining. Thank you for uh, those that support the Geotech Commission, our Geotech Fellows. And as we like to say here at the Atlantic Council, please be bold, please be brave, please be benevolent for the future ahead. And as Vint likes to say, we'll see you on the net. Thanks again. <laughs>